I just wanted to work through uh, test two. Um, this is my copy of test two. Uh, there are different versions of test two, so you might have a slightly different version. Um, but the questions that you got should resemble the questions that I got. So first question states that we've got a box of mass M and it slides down a rough 10 degree incline. And we're asked to consider the work done by gravitational force and the work done by normal force. The state whether they're positive or negative or zero. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. There's no numbers to work out here. So I would of course start by drawing a sketch. So here's my incline. Here's my box. And it's sliding down the incline, like so. And this box is experiencing several forces. There's gravity, uh, there's friction, there's normal force. The question's about the gravitational force and about the normal force. So I'm going to draw all the forces, but I'm going to really focus just on gravity and normal force. So here's the gravitational force. And uh, that gravitational force is is downwards and it's in proportion to the mass of the object. I'll call it Fg here. There's a normal force. It's perpendicular to the surface of the incline and it's preventing the box falling through the incline. And then there's a frictional force. I call it F subgroup F. And that's because the incline is a rough surface. So those are the three forces. In principle, all these forces can do work. All these forces can transfer energy. And we're asked about the work done by the gravitational force and the work done by the normal force. Um, let's remember the general equation for the work done by a force, whatever the force. It's this equation here. W on the left is the work done. F is the magnitude of the force. X is the magnitude of the displacement. And cosine theta is the angle between the direction of the displacement and the, and the direction of the force. And so that's what we're going to use to figure out whether work done by gravity is positive, negative, zero, work done by normal forces, positive, negative, or zero. What about gravity? Well, the work done by gravity, we can figure out whether it's positive, negative, or zero by just looking at the relative direction of the motion, which is down the incline and the direction of the gravitational force, which is towards the center of the Earth. Both of them either are partially down the incline or entirely down the incline. So gravity acts in part down the incline. Uh, motion is down the incline. And so the cosine at the angle between the gravitational force and the motion, that's going to be less than 90 degrees. You can see it's less than 90 degrees. And so the cosine of uh, that angle that's less than 90 degrees is going to be positive. And so that's going to make the work done by gravity positive. So that's greater than zero. On the other hand, the work done by the normal force, well, the work done by the normal force is going to be zero because the object is moving down the incline. The normal force is perpendicular to the incline. There's 90 degrees between the normal force and the motion and the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So that one is zero. And so whichever response here has um, a positive work done by gravity 
and a zero work done by the normal force. This response here is the correct answer. Question number two. Question number two says a block is placed on the top of a vertical spring. And when the block is released and compresses the spring, what is the change in gravitational potential energy? What is the, the change in spring, energy, spring potential energy? Are they positive or are they zero? Um, so just to imagine this, imagine my hand is the spring. Here is the block. I place the block on the spring. I release it and it compresses the spring. And so the block moves downwards and the spring gets compressed. So let me just draw a sketch of that. And the block is moving downwards and the spring is being compressed. Now, when the block moves downwards, that changes the gravitational potential energy. That's mgh. And the elevation h will get smaller. And so the final gravitational potential energy will be smaller than the initial gravitational potential energy. And so the change, this change in gravitational potential energy, final minus initial, that's going to be negative. On the other hand, the spring potential energy, well, the spring was uncompressed. It was at an equilibrium length. Now we've compressed it. And so we've stored energy in the spring. It's gone from, um, if you think of spring potential energy as being one half kx squared, at equilibrium length, x was zero. Now, when we compress the spring, x is no longer zero. And so you get a positive spring stored spring potential energy, one half kx squared. And so that's the answer to that one. So we're looking for negative change in gravitational potential energy, positive change in spring potential energy, this one here. Okay, question number three. Question number three says that block A has half the mass of block B and twice the momentum of block B, and we've got to compare the kinetic energy of A to B. So let's see if we can do that. So um, let me first just imagine that I'm going to call block B I'm going to call its mass m, and I'm going to call its um, momentum p, and I'm going to call its speed b. And then I'm going to write block b a's mass in terms of, and its momentum, and its speed in terms of m, p, and b. So let's do that. So for, for block A, um, its, uh, its mass is going to be half that of block B, so M over 2. Its momentum is going to be twice that of block B, so 2P. And that means its speed, its speed must actually be four times that of block B's. And you can see that from the definition of momentum. If the momentum is twice as big and the mass is only half as big, the speed must be four times as big. So that four times the speed times half the mass gives twice the momentum. And so this little summary here is basically what we're told about the relative masses and the manner and speeds of blocks A and B. Well, now we want the 
kinetic energy of block A compared to the kinetic energy of block B? Well, kinetic energy is a half times the mass. So the mass of A is M over two times the square of the speed. The speed is four V. I plug all those things in and I get eight times one half MV squared where one half MV squared is the kinetic energy of block B. And so this is telling me that the kinetic energy of block A is eight times the kinetic energy here of, of block B. And so the correct answer is eight times. Okay, question number four. It says a block is thrown vertically upwards into the air. Let's draw a picture of that. Here's the block thrown into the air, and here's the earth from which we throw it, not to scale, obviously. Now, if you remember, when you throw a block into the air, there's a, um, as the block is rising, there will be a gravitational attraction between the earth and the um, and the block. There'll be a gravitational force between the earth and the block. And so there's a gravitational force Fg acting downwards on the block and there's also a gravitational force Fg that's equal and opposite acting on the earth. Um, this changes, this force here changes the momentum of the block. So there'll be a change in momentum of the block and uh, there'll be a corresponding equal size, oppositely directed change in the momentum of the earth. And so if you wanna view this block as it flies into the air um, from the perspective of the earth and block system, well, they're interacting with the gravitational force. They're exerting equal and opposite forces on each other. Um, they're transferring momentum to each other. So let me put a couple of signs on here. Let's call downwards the positive direction. And so the gravitational force is acting downwards on the block and is uh, um, increasing the downwards momentum of the block. The, the force on the Earth is upwards, same size upwards, so that's a negative force that changes the momentum. It gives an upwards cement momentum to the Earth. And so the block's momentum is changing, the Earth's momentum is changing. But the sum of these two, the sum of the momentum, the sum up the momentum of the Earth and the block system that sum of momentum is always zero. Whatever the block acquires from the interaction with the Earth, the Earth acquires an equal opposite momentum from the interaction with the block. Overall, for this system, momentum is conserved because this interaction, this force between the block and the Earth is an internal force. And so it's the... Um, momentum of the block earth system that is conserved. Okay, question number five. Question number five asks us about this angular position versus time graph. And it's asking us to decide whether at this location A, and the other location B, whether the rotating object is, is it accelerating here? Is it accelerating here? Yes, it is accelerating at A. It's accelerating at A because acceleration on the angular position versus time graph is a change in slope. 
and it is changing slope here. It's getting steeper. No, it's not accelerating at B. Again, angular acceleration on a position, angular position versus time graph is change in slope. The slope is not changing at point B. And so the answer to this one, I'm finding the answers here, is that at point A, we're accelerating. At point B, um, we're not accelerating. And so that answer is the last answer there. At A, the object is accelerating. At B, the object is not accelerating. Next question. The car travels at constant speed in a horizontal circle uh, with a radius r. And we've got to answer some questions about the net force. Well, let me, let me first draw this and just picture the forces. So here's the road, and I'm going to imagine I'm a pedestrian. And the car is kind of rotating around some axis over here. What are the forces acting on the car? Well, there's obviously weight downwards. There's obviously the normal force of the road on the car, car upwards. And then there's a centripetal force provided by a frictional force that's acting inwards towards the center of rotation. And that's what causes the car to move in this circular path. And so this centripetal force, which is needed by the circular motion, is provided by the frictional force between the car tires and the, um, uh, the road. And so that centripetal force is also the net force. And then the answer to this question would be that the net force on the car equals the frictional force. Okay, this is um, a question, question seven, where there are several parts, four parts, and uh, those four parts involve figuring out work done and changes in energy. So the question says the delivery driver pushes a 1.5 kilogram box, a distance 0.6 meters up a 25 degree frictionless incline. There's a little picture of that here. And um, we're asked to figure out the work done by friction, the work done by the gravitational force, the work done by the normal force, and the change in gravitational energy. And so what I'm going to do for this one, I'm just going to work them all out on this picture, um, rather than stepping through the next four problems, answering them. I'll just work it all out in one go. So, of course, I would draw a picture to begin with. Let's do that. Here's the incline. Here's the block on the incline. And um, this is the 25 degrees of the incline. And the um, block is being pushed up the incline. It's being pushed up the incline by a distance of 0.6 meters. So let me add to this the the forces that are acting. Uh, there's the weight. So that's a downwards force. There's the normal force. That's a force that's perpendicular to the incline. And then finally, there's the person's push. That's a push up the incline. And so those are the, the three forces. Now, we're going to go on and compute the work done by these forces by this sort of master equation for the work done by forces. Again, where the force is F, the 
distance moved is x and the theta is the angle between the direction of the force and the direction of the displacement. That will give us the work done by that particular force. Um, to use that, I'm going to write down the values for each of these forces first. So force of gravity, force of gravity is mg. Um, the mass is 1.5 kilograms. I've got to multiply it by 9.8 meters per second squared. I did that. It's 14.7 newtons. The force, the normal force, well, that's going to balance gravity's force perpendicular, component perpendicular to the incline. So that's cosine 25 degrees times the gravitational force. And that will be equal to 14.7 newtons times cosine of 25 degrees. Figure that out, that's 13.3 um, that's newtons. And then the, and then the force exerted by the delivery driver well, if the crate is being pushed at constant speed, the delivery driver's force must be exactly balancing the component of gravity down the incline. That's Fg sine 25 degrees. And again, I've worked that out. 14.7 um, newtons times sine of 25 degrees. That was 6.2 newtons. And so those are pictures of the three forces that are acting and actually the sizes and the directions of those forces. And so now we just have to, we just have to figure out the work done by each of those forces. So let's start with um, the work done by the person's push up the incline. So the size of that force is 6.2 Newtons. The distance moved is 0.6 meters. The motion is up the incline, the force is up the incline, so it's cosine of zero degrees, which is of course one. And if we multiply all those things together, I got uh, 3.7 newtons plus 3.7 newtons. Work done by gravitational force. Well, the size of the gravitational force is 14.7 Newtons. The displacement is 0.6 meters. And then we want the cosine of the angle between the motion and the gravitational force. And uh, that's 115 degrees. And um, we can see that, imagine this line here that's perpendicular to the incline. There's 90 degrees here, and there's 25 degrees here. And so 90 plus 25 is 115. And so that's the um, 115 degrees between the direction of gravitational force and the direction of motion. Uh, if you calculate this, then you get minus 3.7 newtons. Finally, for the normal force, the normal force would be 13.3 newtons times the distance moved times the cosine of 90 degrees. And as you know, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. That's just a, a reflection of the fact that a force perpendicular to the motion does no work. So those are the three amounts of work done that we had to calculate. There was one other part of the question, what is the change in the gravitational potential energy when we push the block up the incline? Um, the change in the gravitational potential energy is the negative work done by the gravitational force. The work done by the gravitational force is minus 3.7 Newtons, so the negative of that is plus 3.7 Newtons. And so that's the change in gravitational potential energy. And so that's the solution to seven, eight, nine, and 10. So I'm gonna jump on to 11 now. So in question 11, it says we've got a head-on collision between a truck 
and a car. And in the collision, the truck and the car stick together. So I'm going to draw a picture of the truck and the car before the collision. The truck's moving fast, the car's moving slower. They collide. And then I'm going to draw a picture of the truck and the car stuck together. That's the wreckage after the collision. And so this is before and after. And um, we're told a bunch of things. I'm going to write some of them down on here so that the speed of the truck before the collision is 22 meters a second. And the speed of the car before the collision is 12 meters per second. I'll call those V1 and V2. And then one of the questions we're going to be asked is what is the speed uh, of the wreckage after the collision? And I'll just call that um, v, v. And so we're told that information and asked that information. We're also told the masses. The masses of the truck is 10,000 kilograms. And the car is 1,500 kilograms. We've got to find the speed of the wreckage, V. And we've got to find the, in the collision, the impulse that's given to the car by the truck and vice versa, the impulse that's given to the truck by the car. So let's do those three things. Again, they're three separate questions, 11, 12, and 13. I'll, I'll just work them all out here. Okay, so for the, the final speed of the record, this is a head-on, perfectly inelastic collision where momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not conserved. We're going to use momentum conservation. The momentum before the collision is the momentum of the car and the truck, which are separate before the collision. And that must equal the momentum of the wreckage, which is made out of the car and the truck after the collision. And momentum itself is just mass times for times velocity. So I, I fed all, all that in to my momentum conservation equation. If you look at this equation, you can divide it by the sum of the masses. And everything on the right hand side is known to us, the initial velocities of the car and the truck, the masses of the car and the truck. And by plugging them in, we're going to get the final velocity. I won't write out all these numbers. It'll take me too long with this pen. But I did the calculation. And when I did the calculation, I got 27, no, 20.7 meters per second. So the wreckage continues in the direction that the truck was moving at but a bit slower than the truck was moving because the truck has kind of picked up the car and pushing the car along. And momentum conservation has given us that velocity. Now we want to figure out uh, the impulse that's given to the car and the impulse that's given to the truck. So the truck gives the car an impulse. I'll call that the change in momentum of the car. See, the subscript is for car. And that will be the difference between the car's final momentum and its initial momentum. And the car's final momentum is M1V and initial momentum is M1V1. And again, we now know all these numbers. We know the mass of the car. We know the initial and final velocity of the car. So I can plug them all in and I'm not gonna write them all out. Uh, but if you plug them all in, uh, I calculated this and I got a answer that was 13,050 Newton seconds. And it's positive. The impulse given to the car is in the positive direction, the direction which the truck and the car were originally moving in. Now you could do the same sort of calculation for the truck. Difference between its final and initial momentum. Or, this is how I'm going to do it, just a little quicker, I think. You could realize, right, in the collision overall, momentum, momentum's conserved. So if the truck gives the car some momentum, the car must give 
equal and opposite momentum to the truck. And so the change of momentum of the truck, delta P subscript T for truck, is equal and opposite to the change of momentum of the car, delta P subscript C, and so that's going to be minus 13,050 newtons seconds. And so those are the three answers to questions 11, 12, and 13. Okay, next pair of questions is 14 and 15, which are about the gravitational interaction between a pair of textbooks. And we're told that we've got two textbooks, they each weigh two kilograms, they're separated by 1.5 meters, we've got to figure out, we've got to figure out the, the force, we've got to figure out the force and the uh, gravitational potential energy of this arrangement of masses. So let's do that. We're gonna use the use of universal law of gravity for the force. It says that the force is determined by the product of the gravitational constant, the masses of the objects, and the separation between the objects we know all these numbers, or can look them up. Uh, the gravitational constant is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meter squared kilogram squared. The two masses are both two kilograms. And the distance separating the textbooks is 1.5 meters. And so if we plug all those numbers into our calculator, I already did it. I got a number, so it is 0.12 nano newtons. It's um, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10 newtons but I've answered this question in nanonewtons as is asked here. Uh, the other question what is, is, what is the gravitational potential energy of this arrangement of masses? So for that, we want to use the corresponding sort of any energy perspective equation for gravitational potential energy. It's minus the product of the acceleration of gravity, sorry, the gravitational constant times the product of the masses of the two objects divided by the separation of the two objects. Again, we just got to fill in these numbers. 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 for the gravitational constant. Two kilograms for the two masses. I'm not putting it in the unit just to save time here. And divide by 1.5, 1.5 meters. And if you do that, this comes out to be 0.18 nanojoules, which are the units that we're asked to um, answer the question in. And so that's questions 14 and 15. Okay, finally, we got the fully worked out problem uh, which involves this roller coaster. And we're told that the coaster is looping the loop at a certain speed, at a certain radius, and uh, it has a certain mass. And we're asked to consider the top of the loop and the bottom of the loop, the forces on the roller coaster at the top of the loop and the bottom of the loop. And ultimately, we're going to figure out, compute the normal force that it experiences at the top and bottom of the loop. Um, so let me first start, I'm just, again, I'm just gonna sort of answer the questions over here on, numerical questions over here on the right. But the first two parts, A and B, just asked me to draw the, um, 
the individual forces and the net force in the two situations that are depicted. So let me first go ahead and do that. Let's start with the roller coaster at the top. Now remember it's going around at constant speed and um, there will be a downwards gravitational force on the roller coaster, obviously. There will be a normal force of the track pushing down on the roller coaster because the track, remember, is above the roller coaster, so it's going to push down. And I'm going to draw that as if I'm adding that vector to the force of gravity vector. And those two vectors together will provide the net force, which is going to be equal to the centripetal force. And so that's a diagram of the individual forces and also the net force or the centripetal force. And the net force is the vector sum and the centripetal force is the vector sum of the weight and the normal force. Now let me do the same thing for the bottom of the loop. There's the weight downwards. And then there's the normal force. Now it's going to be upwards. It's going to change direction because now the track is below. The track is below the roller coaster. And that's going to add up to make the centripetal force or the net force. And so that's a picture of the forces at the um, bottom of the loop, the loop. Now, again, I've drawn the weight and the normal forces in such a way that you can see the addition of the normal force to the weight. In this case, they're oppositely directed and I'm adding the normal force to the weight vector by drawing its tail on the head of the weight vector. Then the resulting force or the, normal, the net force, which provides a centripetal force, that runs from the, the tail of the weight to the tip of the normal force. And so that's what I've drawn here. And so you see actually something important from the picture that centripetal forces, if I drew them accurately, should be exactly the same length because the object is going in the same size circle with the same velocity. But in one case, weight and normal force act in the same direction and together they provide that centripetal force. In the other case, they work in opposite directions and the normal force has to push much harder to provide the necessary centripetal force. So the tracks are pushing harder on your roller coaster when it's at the bottom of the loop than they are on the roller coaster when it's at the top of the loop. Okay, so the, the question asks us to figure out the normal forces when you're at the top and the bottom of the loop. Normal forces from the track on the roller coaster at the top and the bottom of the loop. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is actually figure out the force of gravity, because we're going to need that, and also the um, centripetal force for the circular motion. That's the net force. We're going to need that too. So for the force of gravity, that's easy, just mg. We know the mass is 1,800 kilograms. We just got to multiply that mass by 9.8 meters per second squared. I've already worked it out. It's, it's 17,640 newtons. For the centripetal force, that's mv squared over r, where v is the radius of the circular motion, r is the radius of the circular motion. And I know the v and the r, they are 16, 17 meters per second and 16 meters. And I plug those in, I won't write out all the numbers. That came out to be 32,515 newtons. Okay, so now we've got the gravitational force and we've got the centripetal force. I'm going to go on and, um, and figure out the normal force. And this, on the diagram, I called the weight. So at the top of the incline, 
at the top of the roller coaster ride. At the top, the normal force and the weight are acting in the same direction. So they both act towards the center of the circle. I'm going to call this that, call that the positive direction, and they together make the centripetal force. And so if I want to calculate the normal force, it's going to be rearranging this equation. It's going to be the centripetal force less, less the weight. And uh, I know the centripetal force is 32,000 newtons. The weight is 17,000 newtons, roughly. And if I plug in those numbers, I got 14,000 872 newtons. So that was the top. What about the bottom? Well, at the bottom, again, I'm going to think of the positive directions towards the center of the circle. The resulting or net or centripetal force is towards the center of the circle. And it's the vector sum of the weight, which is opposite that direction away from the center of the circle, plus the normal force, which is towards the center of the circle. So again, at this point, I can rearrange this equation for the normal force, which is what I'm trying to figure out, by moving the weight from the right to the left. And in this case, the normal force is the sum of the sizes of the centripetal force and the weight. And I know the size of the centripetal force. I know the size of the weight. I can add those two together. I get 50,152 50, newtons. And so that's my answer to the long problem.